Miraculous Events To accurately understand God's unfolding revelation throughout biblical history, we are to consider carefully God's miraculous plan for verifying His message. Here's Gene. Now I want to highlight in this principle uh, a very important statement. Notice what it is. I'm going to read it again. To accurately understand God's unfolding revelation throughout biblical history, we are to consider carefully God's miraculous plan for verifying His message. Now there's one other thing I want to highlight in this principle. Let me restate it. And here it is. To accurately understand God's unfolding revelation throughout biblical history, we are to consider carefully God's miraculous plan for verifying His message. Now before we look at what happened when the apostles returned to Jerusalem, went in a, that upper room, were waiting, along with a group of other people, about 120, we're told. Before we look at that, I want to take you back to Mount Sinai, Exodus 19.9. The children of Israel have come out of Egypt, two million plus, they're out there in the wilderness, they're at Mount Sinai, and God is going to reveal the Ten Commandments. This is the first revelation that God gives in terms of the commandments of God. Here's what we read. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear when I speak with you and will always believe you. Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. Now, what happened? Well, I want to tell you one thing. Moses didn't go up into the mountain and then suddenly come down and walk into the, the camp of Israel and say, Hi, guys. God just gave me Ten Commandments. He wants us to obey them. That's not what happened. Now, we can't simulate what happened totally, but I want to give you just a little feel of what it must have been like. On the third day, when morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people in the camp shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke, because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. When God speaks directly, He wants us to know it's Him. He verifies it. And we see this throughout the Old Testament. But what about the New Testament? Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost. And here's where we pick up the story from the book of Acts. Again, we can't simulate this, but we can have a little feel of what it must have been like among all those people that had gathered there in Jerusalem from all, from all over the Roman world. Listen. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Again, when God speaks, He wants us to know it's Him. And who are the men now that experience this? the apostles, the twelve apostles. You see it clearly as you follow through the story and follow the pronouns. And so we read after this, Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. See, they had come from all over the Roman world for this special 50-day celebration. And this happened on the last day, the 50th day, the day of Pentecost. 
When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? That's how we know it's the twelve apostles. They're all Galileans. They're identified that way. How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? And evidently, these twelve men were able to speak more than one language as they were sharing. What were the languages that were represented? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who lived in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. Now, we don't know exactly what they were saying. And it could have been a very simple message. It could have been, Jesus Christ is who He said He is, the Son of God, God in the flesh. We saw Him. He walked among us. It could have been as simple as that. But the fact is, they spoke in all of these different languages. And it was heard. It wasn't mumbo-jumbo. It was clear, literal languages. And God, and that's a part of another miracle that God is working to verify that He indeed is speaking. Now, Peter's message he gives an explanation to all of this. God has raised this Jesus, and He's just reaffirming probably what they were speaking, and now He's probably speaking in Aramaic, or maybe Koine Greek. But He's speaking a language that all of these people could hear, because Koine Greek was the common language of the day. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. And therefore, since He has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, He has poured out what you both see and hear. Now, I want to point something else uh, out to you. And I simply call this God's verification before and after Mount Sinai. What happened before that? Well, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Remember that? Sent him back to Egypt. But you have all the plagues in Egypt, ten of them. You have them crossing the Red Sea miraculously. You see all the provisions and protection, the water and the manna, all of that leading up to this incredible manifestation where God spoke and the mountain thundered. And by the way, if anyone touched that mountain, God said, he'll die. That was an incredible revelation of His Word. God wanted them to know that He was speaking. Now what happened after that? God continued with the Israelites. Cloud by day, fire by night as they traveled through the wilderness. Provision, protection. Even during the 40 years wilderness wandering, even their shoes didn't wear out. See, God is continuing to verify with these individuals who He is really is. Now, let me illustrate what happened before Pentecost. You have the ministry and miracles of Jesus Christ. Jesus set the stage for all of this to happen. You have then the resurrection, which really set the stage for what's going to happen. You have the ascension into heaven. But what happened afterwards? For a period of time, He had the miracles of the apostles and others. Peter and John particularly worked miracles in the book of Acts. You have Stephen. You have Philip. A few other select ones that worked the same miracles that Jesus did. There are not a lot of them that worked the miracles, but they're mentioned and they're listed every time. Then, of course, you have Paul. And there's about the same number of miracles that Paul worked as Peter worked. So it's very important that God is saying, Peter is the apostle to the Jews, 
Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles, and I'm going to verify the message to both groups. And then you have the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit to the church. And remember, when those gifts came, they had no New Testament scriptures. So God was speaking through his special gifts to the church. We don't know how long that continued to happen, but it happened long enough until another miracle took place, and that is the revelation of the Scriptures. So, God's verification. You see, God wants us to know when He is speaking. And the author of Hebrews really helps us understand this. In fact, against this backdrop, let me just share a passage of Scripture, I think, which will take on new meaning. We read Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. That's what you see in the Old Testament, and Moses and Mount Sinai is a significant, significant demonstration of the way God spoke. Then he says, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son. By the way, the author of Hebrews said 2,000 years ago that we were living in the last days. If that was true 2,000 years ago, we are in the last days. Now we don't know when Christ is going to come because that has been extended for 2,000 years. But according to the Scriptures, we're in the last days. In these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. God has appointed Him heir of all things and made the universe through Him. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of His nature sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. He's at the Father's right hand today, representing us to the Father, our great High Priest. That's what happened when He ascended. So, He became superior to the angels just as the name He inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, when you get to chapter 2, the author of Hebrews gives us, I think, a beautiful summary of what I've explained to you that was happening in the book of Acts through these miraculous verifications. Notice what he said, Hebrews chapter 2. I call it God's verification. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, notice, this salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord. In other words, when Jesus came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But notice, the author of Hebrews goes on, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Who heard him primarily that that he's referring here to? The apostles. Those men who were able, in some instances, to repeat the miracles to verify that this message came from God. And then he says, at the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders and various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to His will. That is a summary of what I've just simply tried to share that we see in the book of Acts. It's the unfolding story as God affirms His message. So that leads to this question. What sometimes happens when we as Christians do not understand these unique periods in history when God verified His message with miraculous manifestations? Well, one of the things that we do is we try to simulate it, sometimes sincerely and say this is what God did at Pentecost, or this is what God did at Mount Sinai. And a lot of times that's sincere, but it's very confusing and very disillusioning. We need to understand that most of history, God was, quote, silent. Only about 150 years of all biblical history do you see these miraculous manifestations. Now when I say silent, God is never silent. But I mean not 
verifying and manifesting the way he did at Sinai and at Pentecost and on Mount, Mount Carmel with Elijah. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't confuse people. The greatest miracle that we have today is the Word of God that was written by these individuals that tell this story. And that's why John wrote his gospel and recorded those miracles that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing have life through his name.